Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson, your host from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares discoveries. Today, we celebrate our 50th episode. We are really thrilled to have. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Got fun confetti there. <laughs> We've invited back some of our past guests to talk about human evolution misconceptions. I'm so excited to get started, but before we dig deeper, thank you to the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camille and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund who made this, ep this episode and this series possible. And thank you all so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting Lunch Break Science for 50 episodes. If you've enjoyed learning about human evolution research, amazing research going on all over the world, and the latest discoveries, you can be a part of helping us make our next 50 episodes. Our goal is to raise $1,500 and we value any amount. Thanks to a generous sponsor, donations will be matched. So if you donate $25, you'll have $50 worth of impact. Now I'd like to bring on our first guests, Dr. Dan Lieberman and Dr. Ann Stone. Here's Dan Greetings. and there's Anne. Um, so uh, how this episode will work today, because it's a little bit different than our normal episodes featuring one or two scientists. They will each talk about different misconceptions. And then at the end of each segment, um, we will have questions for Dan and Anne or and then for each of our speakers subsequent at the end of each segment. So if you have questions about health and evolution, um, and disease, please get those in now and so that Dan and Anne can answer them. So now we are going to tackle our first misconception of the episode, which is that we evolved to be healthy. So Dan, take it away. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Ariel. And it's a pleasure to be here. And it's an honor to be uh, share the screen with with uh, Anne Stone. And, um, and I should say that neither Anne nor I have practiced anything today. So uh, <laughs> So if it comes out a little bit, you know, you know, um, unrehearsed, it's because it's unrehearsed. So I'm going to begin with a very, um, very broad uh, misconception, which I hear all the time, which is that uh, if it's natural, if we evolve to do it, it must be good for us. It must be healthy. This is often called the naturalistic fallacy. And um, in a way of thinking about that, um, to, to start off with, I want to begin with another concept called mismatched diseases. So. So mismatched diseases are something that we talk a lot about in evolutionary biology and particular in um, evolutionary medicine. And mismatched diseases are diseases that are more common or more severe because our bodies are inadequately or imperfectly adapted to modern environments. And, you know, myopia is a mismatched disease. It used to be very uncommon. Um, you know, heart disease, type 2 diabetes. Um, there's a long, long, long and very scary list of mismatched diseases. And, um, and they're really important. Um, but sometimes uh, people take the concept of mismatch a little bit too far, and they assume that because um, our modern environment makes us maladapted to things like eating a lot of sugar or, or you know, never getting any physical activity or whatever, that, um, that all you need to do to be healthy is to just go back to an ancestral way of life. Um, and I know Anna's going to talk a little bit later about the paleo diet. That's a perfect example of some one of those paleo fantasies. Um, but the basic idea behind that is really flawed. And that's because that's not how natural selection works, right? Natural selection cares about one thing and one thing only, ultimately, which is as reproductive success. So the ingredients of natural selection are, are, are there's, there's heritable variations. So we all have variations. Some of those variations are heritable. And, and natural selection favors heritable variations that increase reproductive success. But reproductive success is not the same thing as health. And so there are many adaptations that we have that um, uh, help us uh, improve our reproductive success, but sometimes do so at the cost of our health. So uh, an, a simple example might be, for example, um, the fact that we sometimes get depressed or get anxious or feel lazy or are unhappy. Those, um, those behavioral uh, adaptations uh, actually serve a role. I mean, after all, um, when you're depressed about something, you might, um, you might avoid uh, the thing that makes you depressed. Or when you're anxious about something, you might take, um, you're stressed about something, you might take action to prevent 
um, that stress or just to run away from the lion or whatever it is that's causing uh, that stress. Um, the problem is that um, 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 it, it gets more complicated than that. So for example, our immune system uh, is evolved to take care of all kinds of germs and worms that attack us, but sometimes our immune system uh, uh, um, um, mis mis misfires, and that's because it, um, it's, you know, it's evolved to help us fight infectious disease, but those infectious diseases, but that immune system sometimes can turn against us. Um, another good example might be our prevalence of, of, of obesity. Uh, we are, um, we, we, you know, it's no secret that humans, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> tend to crave foods that help us pack on extra uh, fat. Fat is really important for reproduction. Fat is really important for paying for our very large brains. Fat is important for, um, for storing energy so we can be physically active even when we're in negative energy balance. But, but fat isn't necessarily healthy for us, especially when we have too much of it. And so, um, and so that's another example of, a, of, a, <coughs> of, a, um, <coughs> of an adaptation that can, um, that can sometimes um, uh, cause, uh, cause illness. So, so we need to uh, be skeptical about some mismatch hypotheses and be thoughtful about the uh, about about what the, the notion that something that it, because it's natural, i.e., from our evolutionary past, means that it's necessarily healthy. Uh, that is definitely not the case. That was a really exciting way to start out the episode. Uh, very very interesting, and it, it leads nicely into our next misconception, which will be tackled by Anne which is viruses like the one causing COVID will become milder over time. Great, I, I just wanna echo Dan's sentiment, sentiment and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, you know, this is a common misconception that over time viruses will, will become more mild um, and they can become more or less virulent, you know, severe over time, but they can also stay the same. Um, and it really depends on pathogen transmission dynamics, um, also host and pathogen um, genetics, really, the, the evolutionary process. Um, and, you know, if a pathogen's transmission is not disrupted by rapid disease or death of those infected, um, there's not really a reason for the, the virus to evolve such that disease is lessened, right? So you, you might imagine, though, that, you know, if our immune system is really good at shutting down a virus, you know, after this first infection um, so that we don't get infected again, then obviously um, the number of potential hosts can decrease and this can affect um, how the pathogen evolves. So it might need to, it, it might evolve so that it spreads, um, you know, more slowly. So someone's infected at a lower rate, but, but can transmit the pathogen more over time. So it's more likely they run into uh, someone who hasn't been previously infected, right? So these dynamics and that interplay of host and pathogen can be really important. Um, also, if you think about it as a pathogen kind of burns through a population over time, selection is also going to favor the people who are more resistant to the pathogen. You know, they're likely to leave more descendants and have more reproductive success if we think about it that way. Um, and this may be true even if the pathogen changes in certain ways. And so um, we see this in with immune alleles associated with tuberculosis susceptibility um, in Europe. These uh, susceptibility alleles have decreased over time since, um, since the Bronze Age, which is likely when TB really became um, a really important infectious disease uh, in Europe in particular. Um, and there's a new paper that looks at immune changes um, after the Black Death, which was another major selective events since we think 30 to 50 percent of the European population died. Um, but plague, Yersinia pestis, its um, severity really doesn't seem to have changed actually over time. Um, but uh, obviously our responses to it, both culturally and in terms of potentially the underlying genetics have. You'll have to share that paper because I know our viewers would be interested in, in reading that one. Um, our next misconception is 
uh, that vaccines can be dangerous and overload the immune system. And Anne, you'll be tackling this one as well. <laughs> right. So, so there are a lot of misconceptions about about vaccines, and you know, vaccines are a really important way for us to fight infectious disease. Um, the immune system really isn't negatively affected by vaccines. There's not, you know, it doesn't, even if you get many vaccines at once, um, that's kind of a normal thing for the, for the immune system to be um, dealing with multiple things at once, right? And, and a vaccine is really, it's really an alert system to the immune system. So it says, hey, here's this rogues gallery of, of pathogens um, that you need to look out for. And um, if you see them, get them, right? And so basically what this does is it means that if we are uh, exposed to pertussis or diphtheria or polio or all the, or SARS-CoV-2, that our immune system responds very quickly and can either prevent disease entirely or really um, lessen, you know, make it much milder, which is very important. So if you think about, you know, uh, even just a hundred years ago, actually more than a hundred years ago, around 1900, um, the top 10 causes of death, four of them were infectious diseases, right? So pneumonia, T, which is, can be caused by many things actually. Uh, diarrhea and enteritis also can be caused by many infectious pathogens. Tuberculosis, um, which is caused by one set of pathogens, and diphtheria. Um, and those, you know, pneumonia is back in the top 10. Uh, tuberculosis is no longer in the top 10 for the US. So, um, you know, and a lot of the childhood gauntlet of diseases that really resulted in a lot of childhood mortality, you know, 100, 200 years ago, such as diphtheria, measles, and others, um, really aren't affecting us because of vaccines. Well, now that we've looked at infectious disease, our next misconception tackles, um, let's see here, we, we have Our next conception uh, is um, on the way <laughs> that the rise of non-infectious diseases are the result of people living longer. And Dan, um, you couldn't take this one. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. So this actually follows on nicely what Anne was just talking about, which is uh, it's true that the uh, evolution or the development of vaccines has been, was a major um, uh, 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 you know, uh, shift in our ability to prevent and treat disease. Of course, the other really huge shift that occurred that makes uh, our, you know, the causes of death today very different from, from say, 100, 120 years ago is sanitation. Um, you know, uh, clean water has probably done more to uh, help human health than probably anything uh, that uh, humans have ever done. Um, but, um, but what's going on in, in, in sort of, if you sort of stand back a little bit, is what's something often called the, is the epidemiological transition. So as various infectious um, and communicable diseases have declined in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, prevalence, there's been a rise in non-infectious, uh, non-communicable diseases like cancer and diabetes and heart disease. In fact, today in the United States, the number one cause of death is heart disease. The number two cause of death is cancer. At the moment, the number three cause of death is actually COVID. Um, hopefully that's a short-term phenomenon. But for the most part, most of us are primarily scared of dying from, from Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes and, co and, uh, and, uh, and heart disease. Uh, and, um, and, um, and it's very often said by people in the medical community, in fact, many physicians are taught this, that this is actually kind of a triumph of modern medicine, right? Because people are living longer today, um, uh, because we're not dying young from smallpox and polio and things like that, we have the good fortune of getting older and dying from what, what we often call diseases of aging. And a part of the problem here, there are several problems here. The first problem is <clears throat> there's a misconception that disease, of, of, of diseases of aging as being caused by age, as opposed to there being diseases that occur as people get older. Now, there are a few diseases that really do tick along because of age. One example would be cancer. So uh, cancers are caused by mutations. And uh, the longer you live, the more chances there are for mutations to develop in certain cell lines. 
um, that could then ultimately turn on and make a cell cancerous. Um, so uh, cancers are not entirely caused by aging, but aging is a very major uh, factor in, ca in, 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 in cancer. But, um, but there are many other diseases, um, heart disease, for example, or diabetes, that uh, do that <laughs> rare even among elderly people, right? You, just because you get old doesn't mean you're going to get heart disease. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're going to get <clears throat> type 2 diabetes. The list goes on, right? And, and in fact, if we look in some populations where diet is different, where physical activity is different, where, where basically other aspects of the environment are different, people aren't getting these diseases, which tells us that it's environment that's the real cause or some gene environment interaction, and it's not really aging. The other misconception is that um, human life used to be, quote unquote, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, and uh, that is like <laughs> looking at the last sort of few minutes of a football game and thinking that you understood the football game from just the last few minutes. Because it is true, dur during the era of farming, uh, people's health declined and, and, the, and infectious diseases, like many of the ones that Anne was talking about, became much more common because people started living in small, in villages, uh, with their animals nearby, um, in high population density, with poor sanitation, and all these diseases that used to be very rare or non-existent jumped from animals to humans, and COVID is no exception, by the way, it seems. Um, and and uh, and furthermore, you had malnutrition, and you had war, and you had famine, and all kinds of other nasty things that happened following the origins of agriculture. But if you roll the clock, clock back a little further in time and look at hunter-gatherers, Turns out that the average modal age of death of hunter-gatherers, if they survive childhood, and that's an important caveat, because childhood um, diseases like diarrhea especially um, have a high mortality rate. But if you, once you correct for uh, 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 diseases in the first few years of life, so mortality in the first few years of life, hunter-gatherers live on average about 68 to 78 years. That's their modal age of death, which is actually very close to the United States. The modal, <laughs> the average age of death <clears throat> in the United States now is, um, I think it's 78 now, it used to be 79. Um, and then the other thing is that, remember, there's lifespan, which is what we're measuring, but also there's health span. Health span is the number of years you, you live <clears throat> without any major disease. And the average American's health span today is 63. So the average American is living 12, 13 years uh, um, with significant morbidity. We're talking heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, et cetera, <clears throat> prior to, um, prior to, to death. So, so, um, and, and again, these are modern sort of mismatched diseases. And, um, and so therefore, um, I think we need to, um, step back and take a much more evolutionary view of disease and realize that many of the diseases that are causing not only mortality, but also morbidity, i.e. illness and disability today are, uh, are caused by environment, not by aging and that one can live a long and healthy life. One can age well um, if, uh, uh, and of course, the, the secret to that is no, is no is, it's, it's, well, it's not a secret, right? Um, it, if, you know, diet, exercise, not smoking, um, trying to avoid, you know, too much stress, you know, lawyers, for example, uh, all play a major role. Well, the, <laughs> avoiding lawyers, I'll remember. I'll remember that one. I, I'll definitely try to avoid lawyers. Um, now that we uh, will be transitioning from disease and talking about diet. So, uh, Anne, our next misconception for you is that a paleo diet is the healthiest diet for humans. Right. So this is a common misconception. And what drives me crazy about it is it assumes that there's been no evolution in the last 10,000 years. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, there have been a lot of changes in the last 10,000 years, um, both in terms of our genomes and, and certainly major changes in terms of our culture. Um, so the... Um, you know, we have many adaptations to uh, food, right? So some of us are lactose tolerant, even as adults. Um, some of us do better jobs at um, digesting starches. And um, these are adaptations that have occurred um, in many populations over the last 10,000 years, uh, other ones as well, um, because of our shift in subsistence. And, you know, agriculture was really a cultural development that made um, significant population growth possible in the last 10,000 years, right? You can, you can support 
a, a much larger carrying capacity of humans, as it were. And um, now one downside to agriculture is that, um, you know, sometimes, particularly in, um, say, in subsistence agriculture, you may be very reliant on one crop or a very limited number of, of food stuffs, you know, uh, crops or animals. And this can result in a, in a very um, simple diet that is not as diverse in nutrients as, as you might like. So this sort of monocropping as it, as, as it, if you were, um, is a problem because then that lack of diversity in the diet can affect health just because you may lack certain um, nutrients um, that are important for health. And that's true whether it's a paleo diet or a modern agricultural diet. I can't hear you, Ariel. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> it's much, much better when it's not muted. Um, so Dan will be tackling uh, that it, the misconception that it is normal to diet and exercise. Well, this follows on very nicely from what Anne just talked about. And um, I just want to add to uh, Anne's comment about the paleo diet, which I agree with completely, is that remember also the big fallacy behind paleo diet thinking is that just because their ancestors ate it, it, it must be healthy. And that's just not true. Um, um, you know, if you go, if you spend time with hunter gatherers, their, their two favorite things are meat and honey, and, uh, or honey and meat. And, uh, and I've seen they meet ridiculous quantities of honey that cannot have been healthy. But there we are. Um, okay, so, um, so, but that brings up the issue of diet and exercise, um, which of course um, is very common in places like high income countries like the United States. It's useful defining our terms here. So dieting is a, um, is a kind of a, a, an alteration of your food uh, intake, what you eat in order, to, in order to either promote health or lose weight. Um, so you're, you essentially shift what you eat <coughs> for some kind of health, usually a <coughs> weight loss reason. Exercise is, is, a, is a kind of physical activity. So physical activity is just moving, right? And exercise is discretionary physical activity we undertake for the sake of health and, 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 and fitness. And until recently, you, you know, until, you know, very recently, um, you would be hard pressed if you went back in a time machine to find anybody who was either dieting or exercising. Uh, let's start with exercise. So, so our, our ancestors were very physically active, but they were also energy limited, right? They struggled to get enough calories. Uh, every day they go out and they get enough calories basically for themselves and their families. A surplus is very hard to maintain and quickly shared and used for people who are, or who do not have a surplus. And so people, you know, hunter gatherers and for that matter, subsistence farmers usually struggle to get enough food to eat. Um, and they're, um, and they're also very physically active. They're on, <coughs> on average about, <coughs> about two to three hours of, um, excuse me, moderate physical activity every day. So getting your heart rate above 50% and maybe about 20, 30 minutes to day, a day of, of vigorous physical activity. <coughs> so pardon the, the cough. Now, if you're, if you're sort of energy limited, right, and, you, um, and you're struggling to get enough food, <coughs> why on earth would you then go out, for example, and do a pointless five-mile run in the morning, right? A five-mile run will cost you about... 500 calories. And if you're struggling to get enough calories uh, for yourself and your family, that's a really bad thing to do from an evolutionary perspective. So, so nobody until recently went out and, you know, did a physical activity that was neither healthy, uh, necessary nor rewarding uh, exercise. And furthermore, we have evidence, you know, of from hunter gatherer societies around the world and obesity is essentially non-existent. In fact, I don't know of a single example of an obese hunter gatherer that's ever been documented. Um, overweight is extremely rare and, um, and, you know, we have some sense that maybe there's been some argument that maybe there was obesity in the past from things like Venus figurines, these carvings, but there's no evidence that people actually necessarily, th those were actual portraits of people. Those could have been fertility figurines or, or, you know, wish fulfillment or, or ideas about beauty, et cetera, that were so, so, you know, the idea that these, that were, uh, there was a lot of corpulence in the past is extremely, uh, unlikely. So the idea that, um, and, and one of the things that happens, of course, is that when you uh, diet, dieting is when you go into negative energy balance. So you're taking in less energy than you use. 
our bodies have all kinds of adaptations to prevent us from dieting. Primarily, they make us hungry, right? So when you diet, you become less physically active, you become, um, you become less uh, likely to, to move. That would not have been a good thing for most of the Paleolithic. Um, you also become, you also get all kinds of food cravings. Um, you, you, you activate what's called a starvation response to get you to eat more. So when people struggle to diet, um, what they're struggling against are, 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 are you know, thousands of years of adaptations, thousands of generations of adaptations to prevent us from doing just the sort of thing that you're trying to do. Um, and when people are, are so-called lazy, i.e. they're struggling to be physically active, they're actually obeying, you know, again, thousands of generations of selection uh, for us to avoid unnecessary physical activity. And so I think we need to be, from an evolutionary perspective, we need to be much more compassionate towards people who are struggling to lose weight and people who are struggling to exercise. There's nothing wrong with them. There are no, there's no fault of their own. It's, the, it's, the, it's, it's our biology, which is, uh, which, is, uh, which is working against us in this very modern, strange environment that we now live in. So we were headed into our final misconception of the segment, which is that we evolved to be less physically active as we age. And also a reminder to get your questions in right now so that we can uh, get them to Dan and Anne. So Dan, um, take, take this one away. <laughs> okay, wait, I'll be quick. So, you know, it's, it's this idea, right? We all have this idea that you know, when you retire, first of all, retirement is a modern phenomenon too. I mean, hunter-gatherers don't get to retire. Subsistence farmers don't get to retire. You work until, work until you can't, right? Um, um, you, and you're, 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 you're gathering food, not just for your children, but when you become a grandparent, you're gathering and, and growing food for your grandchildren and also helping take care of them. And it also turns out that when we look at the data, <clears throat> and study after study has shown this, that as you, people get older, the effect of physical activity on people's health actually increases, not decreases. Um, um, one of my favorite studies, I always like to mention, because it's the first big study that was done this, called, it was called the Harvard Alumni Study. It was done by a guy named Ralph Paffenbarger, who, was, um, who figured out that you know, universities are great places to study uh, effects of exercise on aging because they have, because universities basically keep touch with their, their, their former undergraduates for their whole lives. And so he did a study of, of aging alumni um, very carefully, statistically controlled study. It was a prospective study, so he followed people longitudinally as they aged and looked at who was physically active, how active they were, whether they smoked, whether they were overweight, whether they drank a lot, and also how you know how much they climbed the stairs, et cetera, et cetera. And what he showed was that young alumni who were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, who were you know basically spending about 2,000 calories a week, had about 20% lower death rates than than those who were inactive. By the time alumni got to their 70s and 80s, alumni who were physically active had 50% lower death rates than their less active alumni. And again, this is after controlling for everything, and these are age-related death rates. So, uh, and, and, and this has been replicated by many, many other studies. That was just the first study. And so I think there's an evolutionary basis for this because physical activity, um, it, the, one of the reasons it's important is that when you're when you when you're physically active, you stress your body, right? You produce all kinds of reactive oxygen species <laughs> that <coughs> cause damage. You you damage your muscles, you damage your bones, you you glycate your proteins, you cause DNA mutate, you cause all kinds of havoc throughout your entire body. But of course, exercise isn't bad for us. Physical activity is not bad for us, and the reason for that is it turns on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms that counter. Those um, those effects, right? <laughs> so, so when we exercise, we not only produce an, uh, reactive oxygen species, but we also produce uh, antioxidants that mop up that damage. And in fact, we produce a surplus of antioxidants. So I often liken it to like if you spill some coffee on the floor, and the floor is dirty, and then you clean up the floor afterwards. The floor is cleaner than before you spilled the coffee, and that's what physical activity does. It, it turns on repair and maintenance mechanisms that fight processes of senescence, which is what really causes us to age. Um, and, and as a result, as we get older, um, senescence, of course, becomes more and more a potent force. So as we get older, those repair and maintenance mechanisms don't turn off. They still get turned on by physical activity um, and they help us uh, age well. And here's the good news. You don't need to do a lot of physical activity to turn on those repair and maintenance mechanisms. Just moderate levels, just a little bit goes an awful long way. So, you know, just... Uh, 
you know, 20 to 30 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity can lower your all-cause mortality risk at a given age by approximately 30%. That's an enormous effect. So as we get older, follow your evolutionary origin. Um, don't, don't, don't just kick up your heels and, and uh, take it easy. Uh, continue to stay active because uh, uh, that's what we evolved to do. Oh, we will now be taking some of your questions. We have more questions than we have time to address today. So uh, Dan and Anne will be um, uh, following up with, we're going to do a blog post of unanswered questions, as I'm, I'm sure we'll have more questions for all of our speakers as well than we can tackle. Um, one thing I do want to share is that we have prizes to give away, and we're just going to quickly share the hashtag, which is lunch break. If you are watching and you enter hashtag lunch break into the chat, um, you will be automatically be entered into the prizes. And after Q and A, we will let you know what those prizes are. So our first question from our viewers is, um, let's see here, is from uh, Cheryl Kamisa. When did scientists learn about the microbiome and its importance to our physical and mental health? Does our microbiome evolve and adapt over the course of a day or our lifetime? So I'll give a, a really quick answer. Um, I think the the technological improvements in sequencing really let us delve into the the community of microbes that inhabit different parts of our body, and um, it has. Um, let's see, what was the second part of the question? Um, the the um, um, it does evolve over time. Um, so. Dan and I are both getting over colds and things. And during that whole process, it's been shown that the, the microbiome will shift. Um, and it'll also shift uh, during the day. It'll shift, um, your gut microbiome will shift with changes in diet uh, at times. Um, and your microbiome is also really important uh, as a buffer for um, pathogens um, and can yep. stimulate the immune system in different ways. Yeah, you know, the micro, every meal changes your microbiome. It's constantly, it's dynamic ecosystem that's changing all the time. And the more we study it, the more we realize yeah, the diversity of profound effects on our body. So one simple example, right? When you eat fi food that has fiber, and a lot of the microbiome digests fiber, um, we have bacteria in our gut that, that break down those fiber, that ferment them, and turn them into what's called small chain fatty acids. Some of those go into the bloodstream and go all over the body, do all kinds of things. And among other things, they go to the brain where those, some of those small chain fatty acids, for example, affect appetite. I mean, and that's just one of, of hundreds of examples of how our microbiome has all kinds of interesting effects. Uh, somebody also asked about uh, dopamine. There's actually a study that came out today in Nature. Uh, but, you know, the dopamine, which is the, 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 the neurotransmitter reward, you know, it's the do it again thing, right? You know, that was good. I want to do it again. More, you produce more dopamine by far from your microbiome and your gut than you do in your brain, right? Um, the, so, so the more we learn, the more we realize just how important the microbiome is to our, our body's sort of ecosystem. So our next question comes from Jennifer. Why do some infectious diseases require boosters while others do not? Great question. So um, these have to do both with your immune system. So, you, so the boosters will often stimulate the immune system. Um, you want to get enough antibodies um, kind of in your system circulating so that if you're exposed to that pathogen in the future, your immune system will, will recognize it and mount an effective response. The other reason is that um, some uh, pathogens change quickly and some don't. So measles is a very slowly mutating um, virus, um, can kill one in a thousand or more uh, exposed. Uh, but the, vac it, the virus itself doesn't mutate quickly. So, um, you know, getting that initial immunity and you're basically set for life with protection. Uh, then you have something like flu or SARS-CoV-2 that mutate fairly quickly. And so you have to update the vaccines over time. Um, and then there are others like um, the tetanus vaccine where you know, you really, you, your immune system, 
the antibody levels kind of slowly drop. And so every 10 years, they want you to get another one just to lift those back up again so that your immune system is, is kind of primed for any, any exposure. Yeah. And the key, the key cells there was called memory B cells. So um, they, these are the cells that they hide in your lymph nodes and they're ready to get to, to respond. So when you, when you, when a, when a, when a, when a, when a, when a um, you know, a virus comes along that they can recognize. And so you want to keep those memory B cells active and happy and the right kind. And our last question for the segment comes from Jean. Uh, Jean asks, can you comment on the new study on mice that suggests certain gut bacteria can regulate motivation um, to exercise by increasing dopamine level? Oh. Oh, oh. Jean, you're, you're very uh, fast uh, because that paper, to my knowledge, came out today. Um, and I have not had a chance to read the paper. I just, uh, I just downloaded it. But um, I've been busy all day in the hospital here in Copenhagen, and I have not a chance to read it. So uh, I, can't, I can't comment on it. Anne, have you had a chance to look at this new paper? I, I'm afraid I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> You're, it's very hot off. It's so hot off the press. It's, it's, um, I haven't had a chance to even take a look at it. I read the abstract. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you all for your questions. And Dan and Anne, thank you both so much for, for joining us for our 50th episode. And you've really set the bar for, uh, for the episode. So... Um, Thanks just for again, having us. It's our pleasure. You. Thanks so and much. We'll be sending you those questions, and we will also be sharing all of the articles that you mentioned today uh, following this episode. So now we are uh, going to wave goodbye to them, and um, thank you again. Um, and we are going to have our first prize drawing. Um, so if you have put a hashtag lunch break into the chat, you are entered in the, the drawing. Our prizes include this lovely water bottle. Uh, uh, one of the, oh wait, no, it's hard to do this live. Okay, one of our lovely uh, Leaky Foundation water bottles, as well as a copy of our, um, of our uh, 50 Great Discoveries book. We have a, a little video of it. It's at the very, very bottom. We have, we have so many videos today. <laughs> Uh, but it's a wonderful book. So now we will um, we will be picking our first winners. Okay. So what do we have here? We have we're drawing now, and our winner is uh, Darlene. Uh, congratulations. Um, if you have, um, we will be reaching out to you to get your address to send you your prize. And if you have put a uh, hashtag lunch break into the chat, you are still entered to win. We will be having two more drawings today. So um, now get on to our next segment. Joining us from Argentina are Dr. Eduardo Fernandez Duque and Dr. Alba Garcia de la Chica. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello. Oh, we just have Alba. Do we is here. Okay. Um, have, did we lose Eduardo? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. We were, we were on why uh, uh, where one where Eduardo uh, went, and um, for now we will tackle um, your first misconception, um, okay. Okay. which is um, that family groups are uh, in non-human primates consist only of parents and their offspring. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> I appreciate the invitation. Uh, well, uh, if we see, uh, we watch our neighbors, or like if we see a family having, like enjoying a day in, in a park, we wouldn't assume that these family groups that, that we see, uh, we wouldn't assume that all individuals are genetically related. And for Pearl Living Taxa, this social organization has been considered and its evolution has been explained as if these families were always parents and their offspring. Uh, so what we have learned uh, through our studies with uh, our monkeys in Argentina, um, with observational and genetic data, uh, results showed us that these non-reproductive individuals, so adults, juveniles, infants, that they pretty often live with non-related adults. This is like they pretty often live with the stepmothers and stepfathers. 
And this happens because in the population, uh, besides these family groups that have stable, uh, established territories that they defend over the years, we also have a subpopulation of solitary individuals. These solitary individuals, we call them floaters because they float around the territories of these uh, established groups. And these floaters are males and females that when they reach sexual maturity, they leave their home and they start trying to get a reproductive position by expelling and replacing these same sex resident adults. So in pair living animals, uh, what we have instead of these classical families, we have these more similar to human societies, assembled families where like young, adult, uh, young individuals as juveniles or infants live with non-related adults. Here we have a very beautiful picture of a, this classically considered family of our monkeys, where actually we had a replaced uh, adult male. So the adult male in that family was not the biological, uh, the bi biological father of uh, one of these uh, non-reproductive individuals. Well, um, at this one, uh, we, have, uh, we have Eduardo back. So uh, welcome to uh, the episode, Eduardo. Thank you, Ariel. Feel work. Uh, you know, it is, it is one of the hazards. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something else we can share with our audience. So thanks for, for inviting me to be part of the 50th episode. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Congratulations. 50 episodes. My goodness. Congratulations to you and the team. I, I'm, I'm joining you and our audience from Argentina. I was well, but I guess I'm in a smaller town and my internet suddenly crashed. Yeah. Well, the important thing is we have you back, so we can we can tackle our uh, our our first mis our well, I guess we'll go back to our first misconception, which is that adaptations always occur promptly following changes to the environment. Yes, I, and I want to I want to address this misconception with research that I'm, I imagine just Alba already introduced that we do with our monkeys in Argentina. Uh, we were moving from humans to non-human primates, and we had some interesting references in the previous conversations with Anne and Dan about the timing of evolutionary events. So we study owl monkeys. And if we look at the map that shows the geographic distribution of owl monkeys, you can see that they're, they're spread out all the way from, uh, from Panama in Central America to the northern part of Argentina. So wide, wide geographic distribution. Owl monkeys are the only primates in the Americas that are nocturnal, that show nocturnal habits. They are active during the night. We know that they evolved from a diurnal ancestor. What happened, and one of the adaptations that they show as they became nocturnal, of course, as we can see in the picture that's coming up now, is their big eyes. Another adaptation, another evolutionary change is that they lost color vision. They, can, they are color blind. And that was because there was a deleterious mutation in some genes associated with the visual system. So everyone from Panama down to somewhere in Bolivia, the animals are strictly nocturnal. But when you go to the South American Grand Chaco of Argentina and Paraguay, now you have a much better chance to see owl monkeys. Why? Because they're not strictly nocturnal. They also show activity during the day. So uh, when you go to Argentina, if you ever come visit the owl monkey project, as you can see in this picture, you make it to see this cute little animal during daylight. Owl monkeys are both nocturnal and diurnal. So if, if, if when they were nocturnal or in the areas they're nocturnal, they have lost color vision, a question we had with the Almaki Research Project that we wanted to address with some colleagues was what has happened with their visual system as they moved to an environment that now has changed? I mean, have they re-evolved color vision? So we, with, with colleagues Nick Mundi and uh, Brenda Bradley, we collected genetic data from, from a number of individuals to examine how those genes that in the strictly nocturnal species have mutated to make them colorblind, what, are, what is the, the situation of those genes in these cathemeral owl monkeys? That's how we call them in areas where they're both nocturnal and diurnal. Are they 
how, how do they show in their genes that they have now the ability for dichromatic or trichromatic color vision, that they have recovered color vision. And what we found is that there is no evidence even in the Grand Chaco of Argentina, when owl monkeys are moving around during the day, when they need to forage on fruits that may be easier to tell the state of ripeness, having color vision, they do not show any indication they have regained color vision. They are still are color blind, even when the environment they use is the environment of a diurnal species. Why is this? Well, we think that one of the reasons, and we can connect this to some of the uh, things that Dan and Anne were discussing before, may have to do with the timing of events. The Almakis of the South American Chaco only moved to that area maybe 10 or 15,000 years ago. Maybe there hasn't been enough time for them to evolve a new adaptation that would make them is the in color, which could be the beneficial. So that's why I'm saying that the misconception is sometimes that we assume that animal species will rapidly adjust to a changing environment. In the case of all monkeys, as they colonize, as they radiated into a diurnal niche, they have not yet shown the changes. They have not yet modified, evolutionally speaking, their visual system to adjust to a diurnal pattern of activity. So our next misconception, and that was really, really fascinating. I'm so glad that, that you, you were able to make it back so you could tackle that one. Um, our next misconception is that males are always minimally involved in parental care. Uh, yes, the misconception there arises, I think, because we are primates and we're mammals. And as the name indicates, we have in mammals that it is primarily the females who are from the go contributing an awful lot to the care of the infants. Why? Because it is the females who get pregnant. So in the case of humans, you have nine months of contribution to the development of the young, but it also because of lactation. I mean, that's where the name mammals comes from, right? And it is the females, so far as we know, it is only females who can lactate. <laughs> but it isn't true. I mean, this, mis this is a misconception for owl monkeys, as it is also for titty monkeys and some other non-human primates, where the males pr provide a lot of infant care. In, in the case of all monkeys, we, are, we see a male transporting an infant just a few days after the infant is born, when it's very, very much dependent on the mother for milk. It will transfer to the male, and it is the male who carries the infant around. It is the male who plays with the infant more than the mother. Uh, here we see a, an owl monkey male transporting twins, even when nature gives them this natural experiment of having twins, which they seldom do, it was the male who was transporting both infants. They play with the infants, they help the infant if the infant is calling in distress because of the presence of a predator, or maybe there's too wide a gap in the canopy they need to cross. So again and again, we see the males providing an awful lot of infant care, to the point that if you browse the internet, you'll find that we, we've been talking about the, the male owl monkeys as being the best fathers in the world. Really impressive, impressive paternal care. So the question that we ask as evolutionary biologists is why? What are the situations that may lead to such a committed involvement by the male in the care of the young? And what we have learned through research in the owl monkey project of Argentina, through the analysis of genetic samples of a lot of infants and a lot of males, it is that these males that are providing care to the young are, in fact, the biological fathers. They are genetically related. These are males contributing care to infants they have sired. There's genetic certainty. There's father certainty. And so the males, by providing this care, are, in fact, directly increasing their own reproductive success. So our next question, uh, or our next misconception will be tackled by Alba. And um, we're kind of, we, we started talking about, um, about families, but now we will talk about uh, the misconception that individuals in pair living societies are less aggressive. Yeah, uh, before I start with this misconception, I, because it may be a little 
uh, tricky, my first part with what Eduardo just added now about these genetically fathers. And what we see, like we see these groups with non genetically related individuals in the group. So we have infants that do not live with their mothers or fathers. Uh, but what Eduardo is saying uh, is that we have not reported yet extra per uh, paternity rate. So once you are in a group, you will reproduce only with the partner you have in that group. Now, <laughs> We, uh, I will move to my next misconception that individuals in fair living societies are less aggressive. And we are very used to see these big fights in group living animals. We see like sea elephants or lion males fighting, almost killing each other in documentaries uh, while they are competing for, male, for females. <laughs> and we are not used to see this type of behaviors in pair living taxa. And because on each group, we have one individual of each sex, we have one male and one female, it has been classically considered that in these groups, uh, there is low levels of intrasexual competition. And in fact, this supposed lower competition has been used for explaining the lower levels of sexual dimorphism uh, that we also see in these uh, per living animals because males do not need to have to uh, do not need to have to have this um, big fight or do not need to develop this weaponry um, there's supposed to be lower levels of sexual uh, intersexual competition and uh, with the system of the our monkeys that we study what we have learned is that individuals do face high levels of intersexual competition but it is between residents and floaters that they compete and they compete for breeding positions. And because we have male and female floaters, uh, they replace male and female residents. So it is not only the male that has to experience this competition, it is both sexes uh, that are like trying hard to keep their breeding position. And it is both sexes that uh, face this intersexual uh, competition. So, it is starting to be included in mathematical, in mathematical and theoretical models. Uh, this competition for females and, male, and males when explaining the evolution and maintenance of this social organization of pet living animals. We, we cannot, cannot hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to take some questions from our viewers. Um, our first question comes from Anne Marie. And it is on its way. So when you say promptly, what time period are you uh, contemplating for these evolutionary changes? And would this also uh, uh, adaptation also apply to hominids? So, so I'll start with the first question there about promptly. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I am under the impression that we do not know an awful lot about the paleo history of the South American Grand Chaco. But for everything that I've been uh, that I've read and, and information that I've got from colleagues in Argentina who studied the Quaternary, the understanding that I have is that the Grand Chaco was underwater, was some kind of inland ocean, only anywhere between 10 and 20,000 years. So uh, that's what I mean by promptly. In, in, evolutionary, in an evolutionary scale, 20,000 years is not really a very long time. Now, of course, we've just heard from Dan and Anne how we know that humans have had evolutionary change in, in a few thousand years, for example, regarding lactose intolerance. But that's, that's the kind of time frame I was referring to. Too, that owl monkeys, the Aeotus azari species that we studied, the one that radiated most likely through our uh, genetic work, but also the work of our colleagues, radiated from Amazon stock into the Grand Chaco. That radiation, that occupying of the Grand Chaco area is a relatively recent event. So is it possible that owl monkeys who have now occupied the Grand Chaco have not had enough time 10, 15, 20,000 years to really uh, re-evolve color vision. The other possibility that is so difficult to evaluate is that the costs of being monochromatic, the cost of do not having color vision are not that huge to impose a cost on our monkeys, a negative cost, a negative selective pressure for them to pick up the pace of, of those changes in terms, in evolutionary terms. 
That's what I mean by promptly. The second question was, would this also, would this adaptation also apply to hominids? Uh, and Marie, I imagine you mean regarding the, the timing of events. And I'm sure that varies a lot across taxa, even more so with humans, because of all kinds of developments we've had, both biological, but also culturally. It is my understanding that some of the changes we've seen in humans may have been accelerated because also of cultural innovations. So uh, when I say promptly for an owl monkey 15, 20,000 years, that may or may not apply to other taxa. Um, our next question comes from Pete. Um, do, uh, Eduardo, do you think it's possible that Neanderthals were nocturnal with the huge eyes, massive occipital bun and living in a dark world zone? <laughs> I think it's a fantastic question and one that will allow us to really kind of speculate a little bit. And I have a couple of angles, a couple of angles from which I want to address your question, Pete. Uh, first is that I grew up in Argentina and not in a part of Argentina that gets a lot of snow. But when I went to uh, the States, then I lived in Massachusetts and now I'm in Connecticut, so I'm getting snow. And you may be wondering how the heck is the snow connected to this? Well, one of the things that I've realized over the course of, of all these years studying owl monkeys and now with the snow is that there are lots of sources of light, even when we during the night. For one thing, moonlight. And we have done some studies with a hunter-gatherer societies in the South American Chaco, the calm people, where we looked at their pattern of activities at night and day. And we have shown that uh, on nights of full moon, they, they tend to be more active. So it, it's something that I invite everyone to try out. On a, on a night of full moon, it's remarkable how well you can see. And now connecting to the snow, I was just marveled to realize how much on a night of full moon, it's one thing a full moon night in the South American Chaco in the forest, where sometimes the dense canopy may actually block the moonlight. It's a very, very different situation when you have a full moon night in a snowy landscape, right? Now it's, it's remarkable, you can read a book. So how do I connect that with the huge eyes and massive occipital bun? Uh, Pete, I don't dare to speculate that far. <laughs> but what I think, what I would, have, I would like you and the audience to take from this is that, again, in connected to Dan's and, and Anne's comments, is that we sometimes don't appreciate what may have been the ancestral past and, and the, the idea that because it is the night individuals, be humans or non-humans, may not be active, that may not be true. Uh, there are many, many, almost half of the month, whether you have a full moon or, or several days before and after the full moon, you have an awful lot of activity that may allow you to be active during the night. And that in, in high latitudes, like the ones characterized characterizing the, the environments of the Neanderthal, maybe snow could have also potentiate the moonlight available then. Connecting that to the morphology, I think we would have to, to talk. I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable going into that. I don't know. Um, uh, Alba, you're just kind of back from the field. Oh, am I, I'm yeah. not. I, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I just assumed I was probably mute again. Um, uh, so you're just back from the field. So what, what are you working on right now? I, I, I am. Oh, Alba, Alba, go ahead. <laughs> it was directed to me, the question? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I just moved from Formosa to Buenos Aires because now I'm doing a postdoctoral fellowship in the University of Buenos Aires here, where I will be evaluating um, other aspects of the mate choice strategies that our monkeys uh, seem to have in our population. So I will be combining some um, vocal communication uh, vocal communication mechanisms with also genetic um, mechanisms. And Eduardo, you're you're just heading to the field. So what is next for you? Is that for me now? Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're just finishing. We're very, very excited. Uh, Alba and I and some other colleagues were hoping to be uh, putting the final touches on a couple of big papers 
Uh, we, we were just finishing analyzing all of the genetic data that we've collected over the last 25 years. We have now impressive, unbelievable genetic information on four generations of owl monkeys. We're looking really at the great, great grandchildren of the owl monkeys I started studying back in 1996. And uh, actually, if I say what I'm going to say, I mean, our, our visitors today will be the first ones to ever hear this. But we have had some amazing findings, uh, thanks to the genetic. We're learning that some male owl monkeys have sired as many as 12, 13, 14 kids over their lifetime. Same with females. We're learning, talking about the longevity, uh, we're learning that some owl monkeys have lived in the forest as long as 20 years. Uh, we still, uh, this hasn't been published, but even now that we have triplicated the number of young and males for which we have genetic data, I think that our monkeys continue to be one of the very, very few, if not the only mammal for which, pair living mammal, for which we have absolutely no evidence of extra pair copulation. Like Alba was saying before, for every single of the, I think we're now up to a hundred infants with their potential sires in every single case, we have not been able to rule out that male in the group as the likely sire. So uh, it's probably the only mammal species for we we have a hundred percent evidence suggesting genetic monogamy. And that has all kinds of implications for understanding other aspects of the young monkeys, the competition with the floaters that Alba was talking about, the care of the young, uh, and many other things that we're pondering as we move forward to continue the research with the owl monkeys. That we, like I said, it's been 25 years and fascinating to be looking at uh, the F1, F2, F3, and hopefully many, many more to come. Well, Alba and Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. And again, you'll just have to be sure to share uh, all of your work as it's published so we can share it with our viewers because I, again, they'll be very interested to to see it thank you and to the viewers thank please you so much. Stay to email us if we can be of further help further help we'll be delighted to do so thank you ariel and the team and thanks to the foundation thank you thank so you. much thank you so much bye bye, bye. hi um, now we have another giveaway um let's see here we are if you have not put in a hashtag lunch break um please do so now uh we are uh, going to do the drawing uh, so we can start sharing the here we go be exciting to see uh, Alpine Gulch congratulations uh, we will be reaching out to you to get your contact information um, we will be doing one last final drawing uh, after the next segment so be sure to put hashtag lunch break into the chat and you'll be automatically entered in this uh, giveaway. So now we uh, have Dr. Lauren Schroeder and Dr. Ben Saviola joining from uh, the, uh, Canada today. And let's jump right into our first um, misconception, which is that human evolution is linear. Oh, and I'm sorry. You can also say hello to everybody. I'm <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Yeah, hi. And thank you very much for inviting us. It's yeah. uh, it's it's fun to be here again. You know, we, we both did already a, an episode with yeah. you. And it, was, it was always fun. So yeah, it's great. I did my first one um, in July of 2020. <laughs> so I know. It was like <laughs> one of our first episodes and one of our most recent episodes. So it's fun to have you both on together. Yeah, it's yeah. also, yeah, it's nice to yeah. be you know, with my colleagues. In the same room, I know. So it is better. kind of fun to have you both in the same room there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I'll I'll start off with this misconception, and that is that that humans evolved in a in a linear way, and this is very very popular. Like this is uh, if you go out on the street and ask people about how they think about human evolution, it's going to be something linear. There's there's this very classic illustration illustration the march of progress you know with uh with uh something very chimpanzee like on the left um with several intermediate stages and then a, and then a modern human at the end um there's many many problems with this figure i mean number one um of course is that it's it's just not true but it's also in in many of these figures are are inherently racist it's usually a a white male uh kind of at the at the as the pinnacle of evolution which is extremely problematic um 
there's there are many reasons why this uh, why this narrative is so popular. I mean, one was of course when we had a very sparse fossil record, when we only had a only knew a few fossil species, um, it was very easy to arrange them linearly and and show them as uh, as a single continuum. Um, the other reason is probably that humans inherently like these linear narratives. Um, they are simple and they are kind of the way our way, our uh, our brain works. Um, this is so ingrained in, in in pop culture is that you know if you go out there's there's many variations on t-shirts everything from from homer simpson uh, the evolution of homer simpson or uh, even dr pepper uh, ran a, an ad campaign with the uh, with the evolution of, of dr pepper cola a few years ago which created quite a bit of backlash in the US from creationists who accuse Dr. Pepper of now being uh, in, in the pocket of big evolution um, because we are all very, very, very well funded and we do lots of lobbying these days. <laughs> um, yeah, and and of course we know this is a, a misconception because of the many, many different uh, or new fossil uh, discoveries that have been made. Um, and, you know, these fossil discoveries have shown us that uh, populations in the past were very variable, right? There's a lot of species um, uh, in the in human evolution, uh, and we also know from these new discoveries that the relationships uh, between these species um, did not, you know, only happen uh, through simple ancestor to descendant uh, transitions where you know one species evolves in into the the other. Uh, instead what we know now is it's much more complex and and this kind of um uh, complexity has changed the way that we we view our our evolutionary story um we also have the luxury of new uh of new methods these days right we're studying the fossil record uh, which has given us an even better picture of this complexity in our evolution which has changed from this kind of linear march of progress to then to a tree, then to a bush, uh, and now looking more like this this braided stream of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we noticed the best, of course, in 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 the most recent part of human evolution, where we have lots of genetic evidence showing how Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans interacted. And you know, we even have we have a, we have a direct hybrid. We have a we have a piece of bone from Denisova cave where we know that the parents. Uh, came from different groups. The mother was a Neanderthal while the father was a was a Denisovan. And similarly, you know, we see in, in modern humans today, most of us carry a little bit of Neanderthal yeah. or Denisovan DNA in us. Um, so it's a much more complicated story than we thought before. Well, that's a heck of a way to start this segment. Um, let's jump into our next misconception that all evolution occurs through natural selection. Um, so I'm going to take this one and, and it kind of, you know, goes it follows from what we just spoke about. And this is a very common misconception. Um, uh, and it's kind of the way that the evolution is usually taught in, in schools and, and how it's also generally viewed in the public uh, or popular discourse, um, which is as, you know, survival of the fittest. Um, and this is also a, a story that that many previous paleontological studies um, um, used or, or these studies were were often commonly rooted in an assumption that you know when we see differences and similarities in uh the human fossil record uh these were this or these are the sole result of uh let's say you know adaptation to a certain environment or so forth um however when we view um human evolution in kind of the the bigger picture of the evolution of life on earth right uh, we have a lot of genetic and, and fossil evidence uh, that has showed us that adaptation via natural selection um, is not the, the sole or, or sometimes even the primary process uh, of evolution. Um, it's only one part of, of um, usually a combination uh, of both adaptive and non-adaptive uh, processes. So evolution also occurs um, through a genetic drift. Uh, which is accumulated uh, an accumulation of chance changes uh, in a population's uh, gene pool through time, um, as well as hybridization between different groups, um, which can result in in gene flow uh, and possibly, uh, you know, in, an introduction of phenotypic variability uh, into um, um, into a population. Um, and I just wanted to go back to that image on the the screen um, before. Um, 
So yeah, so those uh, this image is from a, a paper that uh, I just actually just came out today um, uh, about kind of these things and um, evolutionary processes in uh, in human evolution. And these different colors kind of represent uh, our current understanding um, of evolutionary processes in our uh, human um, uh, story. Uh, and just the different colors show um, they represent different evolutionary processes and, and you know, where we have evidence for it. Uh, and you can see that, you know, it, it's a, a lot more complex than just uh, natural uh, selection. Um, and we also, as I said, know that uh, these evolutionary processes didn't happen, you know, uh, as a singular process. They were happening in concert all the time. Um, our next misconception is it's on its way. Is on <laughs> uh, that uh, oh oh there we go. Oh, uh, we go. That Neanderthals are primitive and less evolved than humans. We actually have we have questions in our in our in our feed about this. So this is a great great question. Yeah, you know this is a misconception I, I especially like as a as a Neanderthal lover. Um, I I always hate it when Neanderthal is used as a slur. Um, it's you know it's 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 so frequent. It's even used in U.S. politics. Various politicians have been compared have been compared to Neanderthals, and then you know there were outcries about that. Um, and even in you know in, in schoolyards, you hear each other being called a caveman or a Neanderthal. Um, this of course comes from this you know today outdated view of Neanderthals as as kind of brutes. Um, I think we have an we have an image here. Yes, and uh, this is a very early reconstruction. I think from uh, uh, around 1900 by a Czech artist artist called Frantisek Kupka, uh, which shows this Neanderthal that is kind of hunched over with a very very brutish face, lots and lots of hair uh, or fur on his body, um, and even with this very menacing shadow on the cave wall behind him. So you have this picture of you know the Neanderthal being something really savage and uh, and scary. Um, now, research over the last you know hundred years since this reconstruction, or hundred and twenty years, of course, completely changed our view of how Neanderthals were. Especially over the last thirty to forty years, we realized that Neanderthals engaged in much more complex behaviors. Um, um, things like making ornaments from raptor claws and feathers, as you can see in this reconstruction, um, they or, or animal teeth also, they, they used uh, pigments. They even potentially produced some cave art, even though that is very contested. I mean, all these things are very contested. Paleoanthropologists love to argue about um, Neanderthal behavior, probably more than almost anything else. Um, in many ways, the origin of this idea, of course, also goes back to this linear view of human evolution. Neanderthals, uh, in this view, are, are older than us. They are kind of our ancestors, and thus they, uh, they must be more primitive. Even though, of course, we know that Neanderthals are not our direct ancestors. They are close relatives who did contribute, did contribute some DNA to, to most people alive today. Um, but they are not our ancestors, and they definitely were not primitive. They were simply different um, uh, than, than we are. You have something to add to this? Or? Um, no, just no. to say that uh, um, you know, this also ties in with the previous misconception about you know, we know that Neanderthals and, and humans um, hybridized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, talking again about uh, all of the complexity that has um, been, that has come to the fore in the, the previous, in the past, I would say, like 20 years um, has shone a, a light on, on just, you know, um, the fact that these, that the relationships between, between uh, hominin species are not as, as simple as, as we once thought. Yeah, Neanderthals are also a very good example for genetic drift. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these weird morphological features of Neanderthals, um, things like the, the 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 bulging occipital and so on, are thought actually to be not the results of of natural selection, but likely of genetic drift, because Neanderthals lived in very small populations. We know this mostly from genetic data today, and small populations are are simply by math um <laughs> you can you, you can calculate this in using various population genetic models in in small populations genetic drift um is a much stronger factor than than natural selection so um they are they're a good example for this too well we are at our final misconception of the episode and it's a really good one and that is the existence of a missing link in human evolution 
So, so yeah, I'll start this one off. Um, but this is an extremely uh, common misconception uh, in you know public discourse, um, and you know because so many newspapers and magazines or you know online things they use the phrase in announcements uh, of new fossil discoveries um, uh, of you know not just you, hominin fossils, right? So this is discoveries in the paleontological world. Uh, you know, we often hear things like scientists discover the missing link between X and Y. Um, so the question is, you know, why is this a misconception? And it's got something to do with what we spoke about uh, previously in terms of the complexity of human evolution, of evolution in, in general. Um, our evolutionary story and, and the relationships within them um, are, not, are not just links in, in a chain. Um, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, this idea of, of the chain actually goes back actually to, to antiquity even. There's this, we call it, it's called the great chain of, uh, of being, which was very popular from, from antiquity to the medieval and even the early modern period. And it's kind of reached the, the, the pinnacle with a, with a guy called uh, Charles Bonnet, a Swiss, um, you'd call him naturalist, um, who proposed that everything in nature, starting from minerals, um, through various uh, crystals and then and then and then plants and fungi uh, onto animals forms one continuous chain uh, up to up to humans um, and, and it is all connected um, you know and so the missing link is, is simply a part of this chain um, what is especially misleading with this idea is this idea when you're looking at missing links between ex uh, existing species. For example, the missing link between chimpanzees and humans. And of course, because chimpanzees are not the ancestors of humans, even in the great chain of being sense, you cannot have a missing link. All we have today is a, is a common ancestor. Um, so, you know, please, please stop using the, the missing link <laughs> metaphor. Um, I think all, all of us paleoanthropologists have stopped doing it, except, you know, sometimes it, it still appears in the media. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe not all of us are as good about it as we as we should be, um, because it is confusing and and goes back to to these uh, really non-evolutionary ideas, which we, we, we should try to avoid. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I, I do have to quickly thank, we have had uh, several uh, anonymous uh, donors uh, donate to the Lunch Break Signs, and we just want to thank you so incredibly much. Um, it, it's our, just, it's just, I'm sorry, I'm like getting choked up about it. <laughs> um, but we just really appreciate all everyone watching and, you know, to helping us make more episodes. It's just, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to go into questions before before I start crying. <laughs> okay, so um, our first question is from Jimmy. Um, uh, what cognitive traits may have been beneficial for our ancestors, but now drive mental illness? Can this be the same as Neanderthal-derived diabetes variants that don't indicate diabetes in an ancestral? Um, I think yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is this is difficult. I'm. I I always caution. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the lot of studies are are looking at, at genetics of of recent mental disease, and then they are comparing it to the to the Neanderthal genome and are saying, oh look, um, there are differences in in certain genes that are linked to schizophrenia or 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 whichever uh, other mental health condition between Neanderthals and modern humans and that there's been uh there's been uh selection going on here the problem is always uh you know differences in in this gene or even the evidence of selection in this gene does not show directionality you know it, it does not indicate necessarily that that um something we would see in the Neanderthals would actually directly lead to certain uh a certain uh mental conditions, especially because most mental conditions actually are genetically incredibly complex. You know, they are they are influenced by many, many different uh, loci in many, many different genes. And honestly, we have no real idea of how all of this plays together. You know, we see, you know, very slight uh, tendencies. And, and usually we find these things only when we do these genome-wide um, association studies where we look at hundreds of thousands of people, we look across their whole genome and we find slight signals in one direction or another in, in some part of the genome. I'm, 
I think that taking any any like interpreting this directly with regards to to um, the mental capabilities or mental conditions of extinct species is 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 just not really scientific mm -hmm. and not not reliable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Uh, our next question comes from Anne Marie. As she has, although uh, branching rather than linear evolution is widely accepted among the scientific community, why do text textbooks still not include acknowledged species such as Sidiba, Naledi, or uh, Denisova? Um, okay, I think two answers to this. Um, there are textbooks that have taken these. Um, these uh, species or new discoveries into account, um, but it takes long to publish <laughs> these yeah. textbooks. Um, and and you know, for anyone who's ever taught human evolution um, at a you know college level, will know this. You know, it, it's like a common thing where the textbooks are are going to be outdated um, in terms of you know new discoveries happening in the field. There is, however, a textbook called Explorations, um, which is an open access uh, biological anthropology textbook uh, that is trying to, um, because it's open access and it's it's like an it has an online version, um, it's trying to update as you know new discoveries have been found. But this is a it's a typical you know thing um, for anyone who's who's ever taught um, human evolution. I always tell my students at the beginning of my classes, uh, you know. The textbooks are probably going to be <laughs> going to have to be changed by the end of <laughs> this course, um, and usually I'm I'm correct <laughs> in that. <laughs> yep. Just like we have to update our slides. I mean, yeah. really, it's 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 kind of typical. It's it, it, always something exciting comes out right the week that I'm teaching a certain yes. topic, and then I'm like scrambling to update my slides and and still include at least a little bit on it exactly. um, on time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's why it's so exciting. <laughs> that's the fun part. Um. I definitely like I I was <laughs> googling that <laughs> while you were answering the question. Um, but I'll, we'll definitely share the textbook in the follow up email as well. Um, we had we just had another donation from an anonymous donor, so thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from uh, Xander. Are there any excavations being conducted on finding the last common ancestor of humans and chimps? near the area of finding um i won't i won't i won't try to to mispronounce that name so the anthropist mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right um, thank you lauren <laughs> i don't know i mean you know yes there there is a lot of research going on in africa at the moment but of course you know especially the last few years covid has been a, has been a huge problem mm -hmm. um there's very strong ethical reasons why why you know, during a pandemic, you should not go somewhere else and infect uh, populations that are that likely have much less access to vaccinations than we would have in North America or Europe uh, with COVID. So uh, research has been strongly reduced. And then there's also various other problems, uh, you know, in, in parts of Africa, politically, it's been it's become more difficult to, to do research. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not 100% sure what's going on in in Chad at the moment like with in terms of um of excavations um mm. um but a few years ago I mean they were they were active like okay. just pre-covid like 2018 19 I think there was research going okay. on but So yeah. So it's... yeah, I guess the answer is <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. <laughs> My final question, and I, I, I feel like you, you two are being put on the spot because you are the last two left. Um, but we've had this whole episode about misconceptions. What do we do to help the public not make any of these mistakes? Do think do shows like this? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I feel. You know, it's it's one of the things I always talk to my students in the one of the first lectures that I do in my in my class on human evolution and evolutionary anthropology. I tell them that they have to be kind of our force multipliers. Like they go out of this class and they have to 
clear up misunderstandings about, you know, the biology of humans, human behavior, race, mm -hmm. you know, they have to talk, you know, when their racist uncle says some stupid things at Thanksgiving, they need to speak up because they are actually, they are the experts and they have to, they have to bring the, you know, the, the, the reality, the truth, the, the worst thing, <laughs> the science out a little bit into the public and, uh, and, and spread the, spread the good news about human evolution. Um, and make sure that that people uh, understand why this is relevant and what we can say and what we can't say. You know, there are actually many, many things about human evolution that we'd like to know, but we can't say. And of course, frequently, these are the things that people like to ask. Mm -hmm. And this is where many misconceptions then also come out because real scientists can't say much about, you know, language in, in Neanderthals in the end. Like we, we cannot actually study it in detail. Um, and then you have people who, who come out and, and tell stories about it that are that are more problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and just kind of um, piggy, piggybacking off that, but also what I said at the beginning, you know, have more shows like this. I mean, outreach is is a, a big thing, and uh, and these guys, you know, lunch break science, a um, bunch of other things that the Key Foundation has been doing, but also. You know there are other YouTube channels. Um, I think uh, I saw Seth was was commenting in um, over here. Uh, he has a um, uh, a channel called World of of uh, Paleoanthropology, and I think the I think it's maybe the story of us. Um, those kinds of things, right, um, are are great for the public to learn. Um, you know about common misconceptions and and you know why they are misconceptions. Um, uh, yeah, so. So thank you. <laughs> well, Lauren and Ben say thank you so much for being here. Um, hang around, Rose. We, we're going to uh, do the last giveaway. Um, so we are drawing that now. And let's see. Oh, oh wait. <laughs> it's not twice. supposed to let you enter <laughs> twice. So. Um, we will redraw this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in my uh, show notes uh, for StreamYard. Oh! Perfect! <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Maybe third time is the charm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Anne Marie, <laughs> congratulations! <laughs> thank you, um, th thank you so much. And I also wanted to thank uh, Christina B, who also um, had just uh, donated uh, as part of our fundraiser. Thank you so much to all those who've donated uh, as part of our fundraiser for Lunch Break Science. We just really appreciate it, and you know, we are looking forward to a whole new season of. Um, or not season, but whole new set of shows going into, I, I can't wait for our hundredth episode. Uh, you, uh, Lauren and Benza, you'll have to ha help me start brainstorming on that. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. Mm -hmm. So next time on Lunch Break Science, we will be seeing, or uh, uh, Dr. Chris Sabai will be on Lunch Break Science and we will be doing kind of a choose your own adventure in uh, a Kabali National Park in Uganda. She's uh, just, recently back from the field that has some amazing video footage so we cannot wait for that episode so oh, oh sorry uh thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the leaky foundation until until next year and next episode stay hungry for knowledge thank you bye bye, bye. bye. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leakey Foundation and made possible by the support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Tra uh, Arnold Travis Education Fund. If, you're, if you like this episode, subscribe, get notifications, hit like, and support so that in the next 50 episodes of Lunch Break Science will be possible. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, or check out our website. Still hungry for science and can't wait till 2023? Check out Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts. You can visit our website for educational programs, research grants, scholarship, human evolution news, supporting programs like Lunch Break Science, and much more. Thank you all for tuning in. Stay hungry for knowledge and see you in 2023.